Amen. Thank you all for being here today. I know that it's some beautiful summer weather out there. So, um, I want to start with a, a few announcements uh, this morning. Uh, uh, as we first announced last week, uh, Debbie and Debbie are getting married on Saturday afternoon, July the 18th. And that will be at 3 p.m. And the church is invited to be a part of that. So uh, put that on your calendars. Um, we continue to have our Bible studies on Tuesday night at 6.30. Uh, Tom Rogers is leading, studying uh, the book of Matthew. And on Thursday evenings at 6.30, Adam Dennis is leading, studying uh, the, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Um, We're going to be having a, sponsoring a marriage night uh, simulcast uh, through Right Now Media. Uh, that'll be here on Saturday night, September 12th. Uh, it's uh, $30 a couple to register. You can do that online. Uh, speakers uh, include Matt and Warren Chandler. So uh, the, if you need more information about that, you can see me. Um, our offering plates, uh, as we continue to, uh, to adhere to state guidelines, our offering plates are in the back. Uh, so we'll be taking up an offering, but if you would like to support the ministry, you can place it uh, in those plates as, as you leave today. And also, uh, we've been, and kind of COVID got to play this, but we've been talking about Independence Day and, and trying to take a, a hunk off of our, our mortgage. Uh, there's a bird cage, I believe, back there by that plate. Uh, if you have a specific offering that you would like to give today to help uh, uh, with our, the help retire the debt on this building, uh, you can put it in there. And all of the all of that offering will go uh, directly on our, onto our mortgage payment. Um, Courtney and Ian are going to be starting a financial peace university class here on September the twentieth. Um, uh, Dave Ramsey, you may have heard Dave Ramsey's name, uh, it, especially for young couples um, and young people, uh, it's an excellent thing, uh, really for everyone, but uh, particularly those as you're starting out. And so you'll be getting more information on that. Also, uh, we have a sign-up sheet out front for our grief support group. That will be starting soon. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can sign up out there with your phone number on there. And uh, we'll be starting that here as we, uh, as the state continues to let up some of our guidelines. Um, Vacation Bible School, um, we are going to be doing that uh, virtually, right? Is that the right word? Um, it's a three-day Bible school program, and, and and you'll be able families will be able to download it uh, into their homes, and and uh, there are songs and and uh, activities and, and uh, little projects. So uh, you'll be getting more information about that, um, um, and you'll be able to kind of do that whenever you want to. So uh, so we are going to have vacation Bible school. Um, we're also going to be honoring our graduates, uh, our high school graduates, on uh, Sunday, July the 26th. Um, we'll be doing that, and so if you have a high school graduate that, that you would like us to honor um, on that day, uh, please either text or give me that name so we can get them on the list. Uh, finally this morning, uh, because it's the first Sunday of the month, we are going to be celebrating communion at the end of our service. Uh, we invite those uh, uh, folks who would like to participate in that to do so. Uh, it's a little bit different, uh, again, because of state guidelines. There are uh, communion cups uh, back on that back table. If you do not get one, I'll give you uh, some time before we do that to pick one up. Um, and so we will be celebrating communion today. So, uh, again, we invite everybody to do that. Um, turning to our prayer list. Uh, we, uh, as always, continue to remember Jill Cooley, um, uh, Carson Cook, and Lauren Sharp. Uh, Mike Foley, uh, uh, Toy sent me a, uh, an update on Mike today. Let me see if I can get to that real quick. There it is. Um, said he uh, has to have surgery Tuesday to remove a stent in his kidney because it is causing bleeding. Uh, he went Friday to get a COVID test before they would do the surgery. Uh, so we want to continue to uh, pray for Mike uh, as he goes through that. Uh, 
Morris Alpert uh, continues to have some health issues. Uh, Tina Helton, Doug's niece, still battling through that. So uh, we want to continue room for her. Uh, Jess Mullins, uh, Tyler Elsey, uh, Luther Wheeler, uh, Ross Galbert. Um, if you follow social media, uh, Ross has some very serious uh, health issues, uh, and I believe he's home now. So we praise God for that. Uh, Sandy Ward, uh, Wednesday, yeah, early Wednesday morning, uh, Sandy went to the hospital uh, with a kidney stone, and uh, so that has, they, they weren't able to do the procedure, and then she went back the next day to have it done, and she had a fever, uh, so they did a COVID test on her, and they were waiting that, but they weren't going to do it. They didn't think she had COVID, but they needed to make sure before they did this. So uh, Sandy's not with us here today, but uh, we want to remember uh, Sandy. Uh, Shona Thomas and Rachel Wade's cousin Jamie, uh, he had about a 10-hour surgery this week, and uh, it came out really well. The doctors were very pleased, so we uh, praise God for that. Uh, Devin and Bethany Armstrong, they're getting ready to have their twins. So as we approach uh, due date, uh, we want to continue to remember Devin and Bethany and the babies. Um, Jaquita's, uh, Jaquita's uncle Jim Wilson, uh, we got a, uh, a message to, this morning that uh, he had been taken to the hospital with some heart issues. So uh, we want to remember Jim. And then uh, Mickey Lynn last night about midnight, she sent me a text. She was working, she, she works at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, and uh, she was just sort of overwhelmed. Uh, she said last night there were all kinds of people bringing their children in who had been burned by fireworks and had ATV accidents and, and all kinds of things. Let me see if I can get to that. Technology is wonderful thing. Um, so said there were kids coming in with burns, uh, fireworks burns, ATV accidents, uh, and they also had just brought in a three-year-old that was uh, unresponsive uh, with a drowning. So uh, she, was, uh, she was dealing with all that last night at midnight. And she just reached out and asked for prayer. And, uh, uh, Fourth of July, sometimes we celebrate. Uh, we don't think about those things, I guess, but it can be a very dangerous thing sometimes for especially uh, children. So uh, we're going to lift them up. And then uh, we had a praise, Greg and Barb sent a praise. Their son Derek helps coach his oldest daughter's softball team. And the other coach, tested positive for COVID, um, and uh, there were some, they, Derek had the test, and there were some anxious days, but uh, Greg reports that, that he tested negative, so uh, they give God uh, the grit and glory for that, so uh, that's our prayer list today, uh, as, as we've been doing, if you have, if you have a, a prayer uh, concern or praise, you text it to me, we'll include it on, on the list, so. Um, I'm going to ask Bobby if he would just lift up these prayer concerns uh, for us this morning. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here together today. Uh, Lord, we pray over all of these requests that, that there is much hurt in this world. There is much pain and a lot of suffering. And, and Lord, we know that, that you are faithful to hear our cries to you. You listen to us. You care about what is on our hearts and on our minds. Um, you care about the suffering that we endure um, weekly, daily, minute by minute. Father, I pray um, over the coming months as the guidelines begin to lift that, that we would be diligent in taking care of one another. Um, I pray over those uh, health care workers that are still battling uh, COVID-19. I pray that you would strengthen them and protect them. Uh, Father, I pray over all the other requests that that was mentioned, I pray that that you be so faithful as to hear and act upon our prayers and upon um, our requests to you. Lord, you are faithful to hear us, you are faithful um, to, to show us your grace and your mercy. And I pray that you would continually do that as we continue in our worship service, that you would draw our hearts near to you, that you would comfort us, care for us, and shepherd us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we also uh, got a card from the, the folks at the Rising Sun Senior Housing. 
Uh, a few weeks ago, we had our milk uh, distribution out here. We delivered a bunch of milk down there to those folks. Sean brought in a car today, and I'll put it on the board out there, but we sure appreciate those folks, and we uh, continue to pray for them. So, um, yesterday was the 4th of July. I'm sure that comes as a surprise to no one. Um, here in America, we celebrate it as Independence Day, the day in which our forefathers began the process of breaking free from the British and British rule and becoming an independent, free nation. And on July 2nd, 1776, Thomas Jefferson wrote these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, this sentence forms the core not only of the document that we Americans call the Declaration of Independence, but is also one of the most famous sentences ever written, because it not only declares the independence of a country, but also its people. So with that this morning, I, I want to challenge each of us to, to consider some things. If, if we take a day each year to specifically celebrate our independence as a nation and as citizens of that nation, in what way do we as Christian people celebrate and declare our independence, our moving from spiritual slavery in sin to being free? Do we as Christians have a Christian declaration of independence. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, again, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to gather here. I ask a blessing upon the, all the members of our church family who are traveling, who are, are taking vacation trips, uh, those folks who are still aren't with us, uh, who have uh, conditions that don't allow them to be here during this, uh, this time. And, and I ask a blessing, Father, upon those folks who are here. Uh, those folks who will watch us later on social media and other places. And, and Father, we just ask that in all of that, you would be glorified. Father, we, we ask your hand of healing upon our nation. Um, we ask that, that uh, not only our nation, but our world, Father, that, that this virus would go away, that, that we could uh, again, once uh, uh, begin to have some normalcy uh, in our worship services and in our lives. Father, I ask this morning that you would open not only our minds, but our hearts, that as we look at your word, that, that uh, we would draw closer to you. Again, Father, we love you, and we ask these things in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. You know, one of the most debated issues throughout our history as, as a country is the discussion about the separation of church and state. Many people will tell you that the guarantee of the separation of church and state is the hinge upon which our democracy swings. That church and God have no place in our government. And those people would be wrong. Um, I want us again to look at the sentence that Jefferson wrote. It said that they, all men, all people, are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. They, they weren't given these rights by the government. They were given these rights by God. Jefferson and all those assembled at the Continental Congress that day saw those words, their creator, and no one argued that it didn't belong. And over and over and over again, we find proof through history that this nation was founded on Christian principles, and under the authority of God. What they were making sure didn't happen when they wrote about the separation of church and state in the Constitution, not the Declaration of Independence, was that this new nation wouldn't create a national religion and make everyone join it and abide by it. Because that's what they had just left from England with the Church of England. They wanted people to be free to worship as they wanted to, that the state would not establish, the nation would not establish a religion. 
So we look here at Jefferson's words. All men are created equal. Now all men being equal have been given inalienable rights. They've been given rights that are guaranteed. And they have been given those rights not by the government, but by God. And those rights among them, Jefferson writes, is the right to life, the right to liberty, the right to freedom, and the right to pursue happiness. See, our founding fathers saw those things not only as individual rights of people, but that they were so important that they were guaranteed, they were unshakable, and that they had been handed down by God Himself. And those things appear not only in the Declaration of Independence, but they appear in Scripture as well. We have the right to life through Jesus. John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. John chapter 10, verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You have a right to liberty. You have a right to freedom through Jesus. And, and that can be both good and bad. Yes, we are free. But we should always be aware that in spite of that freedom, we are not necessarily called to be free. Instead, we are called to be wise in our actions and our decisions and in what we do with our freedom. Because although we are free, we are not free from the consequences of our actions. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22 warns us of that. It says, Flee the evil desires of you and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And we are also called through Jesus to pursue not just happiness, but joy. Being happy is temporary, but having joy is a state of mind. It overcomes the ups and downs of life. We as Christians can choose to find joy in situations that don't necessarily make us happy. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, Paul tells us that very same thing as he sits in a prison cell. Paul says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. You may know 14, 13 is, or, uh, 413 is, I can do all things through God who gives me strength. So, if those rights are given to us through our National Declaration of Independence, as Christians, do we have one? What declares us as independent? What declares us as free? Well, I contend this morning that although Scripture is filled with passages about freedom, I want to bring you to just a couple of verses that I believe that we should all carry in our hearts. And they're all found in the Gospel of John. So if you have your Bible and you want to flip to John, you're not going to have to hunt much um, uh, to get where we're going today. They're all found in the Gospel of John. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, uh, the uh, scriptures are going to be on the, slot, uh, on the screens above me. But there are three basic passages that we need to not only hear, but I believe we need to know with all of our heart. The first is actually towards the end. It's found in John chapter 17. As Jesus, on the night he knows that he will be betrayed, is in the garden and he's praying to his heavenly Father. He, he prays for God to be glorified in what's about to happen. 
He prays for his disciples, those people who were closest to him. And he prays for all of his, for all believers. And what I want you to see is found in chapter 17, verse 17. As Jesus prays for his disciples. Jesus says these words in his prayer. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So here, Jesus prays for God to sanctify his people. He says, sanctify them by truth, by the truth. What he's asking God is that, that his disciples be set aside for a sacred purpose. That they be made holy in God's image. And how are they going to be made holy? They're going to be made holy by knowing God's word. Why? Well, Jesus says because God's word is what? Truth, right? Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Make them holy through your word. So if the disciples and the believers were set aside by God for a sacred purpose, and they were being made holy in the image of God himself, and that was and is happening by us knowing the truth, so where's the truth found? It's found in God's Word. It's found in the Scripture that has been divinely brought together into the Bible where we can, for ourselves, see God at work. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. So from there, flip back to chapter 14, where we find a very familiar passage. Jesus is speaking to his disciples as, they, as he prepares to leave this earth and return to his heavenly Father. And in chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's this beautiful passage of Scripture that you've heard many times in, in many different situations. In fact, you heard me use it just a couple of weeks ago when we talked about Thomas in one of the sermons. Jesus sort of looks at him and he says, you know, don't worry about things. I, I know you believe in God, so believe in me too. My, my Father's house, heaven, is big enough for everyone. If there were restrictions on who could get in and who could be there, I would have already told you that. I'm leaving soon and going back there to prepare, prepare for your arrival at some point. And when I get things ready, I will come back to get you all. Because it's my desire for you to be where I am. And then Jesus says this. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And listen to how Jesus answers that question. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now we've heard that passage so many times and we tend to focus on Jesus being the way because that's the question Thomas asked. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I am the way. But what other declaration does Jesus make about himself here? He's the way, but he's also the what? Truth. 
right? And life. So back to John 17. How can we as Christians set, be set aside for sacred work? How are we being made holy? That's happening by knowing God's word, which Jesus in John 17 describes as the truth. Your word is truth. So stay with me here. We, we, all of us, are in the process of being sanctified, of being made holy in the eyes of God by knowing his word, by knowing the truth. What is the truth? God's word. Who is the truth? God's son, Jesus himself. He calls himself that here in chapter 14. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. We're, being, we're made holy by knowing the truth, right? What's the truth? God's word. Who's the truth? God's son. So our mission, if you will, as Christians is to strive towards holiness by knowing God's word and by knowing God's son. And that's going to take us to our final verses this morning. They're still in John, like I said, and they're in chapter 8. We started with 17 with 14, now we're backing all the way up to 8. The first is a very short verse that packs a lot of spiritual punch. Jesus is debating all sorts of issues with the Jewish leaders when he says this in John 8, verses 31 to 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's break that down so you don't miss it again. Jesus starts with if. If you do what? Hold on to my teaching, right? You hold on to the words of God shared through the teachings of Jesus, if you do that. Then Jesus considers you to be what? His disciples, right? If you hold on to my teaching, then you are really my disciples. You're part of a chosen generation. You're part of a royal priesthood. You're, you're part of you're one of God's chosen people. You're part of the family of God. And because you're in the family, you're being sanctified. You're being set apart for something sacred. You're being made holy. And if you hold on to Jesus' teachings, then you will know what? The truth, right? You hold on to my teachings, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. The truth again is what? What is God's truth? His word found in Scripture. And his truth is found in human form through his son, Jesus Christ. So, if you hold on to God's teaching, and you acknowledge that teaching is God's truth, and you acknowledge God's son as truth, what does Jesus say here that the truth will do for you? It will set you free. Children of God, re rejoice this morning in your freedom. Rejoice in your civic freedoms of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But also rejoice in your spiritual, eternal, holy freedom that is found in Christ Jesus. John chapter 8, verse 36 says this. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That, today, is our declaration of independence. It is our spiritual declaration that although we are still in this world, we are not of this world. Because we have been set apart, we have been, we have been pulled away from sacred responsibilities, we have been pulled away in a process of being made holy. We are part of God's family. And through knowing the truth, we are no longer slaves to the sin of this world. 
In fact, we're quite the opposite. We know the truth in word and in person. And knowing that truth, we have been set free. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, again, we just thank you for the opportunity to, to gather here. And Father, as we celebrate being a free nation uh, on the 4th of July, I, I just ask that you help us to celebrate being free people each and every day. We celebrate with you in that. Father, you, through your word and through your son, you have provided the truth. And, and it says when we know the truth, we are set free. And when we are set free by your Son, we are free indeed. Help us to not only see that freedom, but to live it. Help us, Father, grow closer to you. Help us to see that, that we're never going to be truly free without you. Father, it's my prayer this morning. If there's somebody in this room, or if there's somebody listening and through social media or whatever, and they're searching in their heart, and they're searching in their mind, and they're saying, I don't feel free. I feel like I'm still just a slave to all the things that are going on in this world. Help them to see, Father, that, that they're never going to truly be free until they're free in you and through you. Father, you are our way. You are our truth. And you are our life. Father, I can think of no better thing to do on this Independence Day than for somebody who's never really come to grips with that before to finally, once and for all, declare that they are indeed free. They're spiritually free in your love. Father, for somebody here today who needs to do that, I just ask that you place a boldness in their heart that they would come up during our human invitation and they would make that known to me and and ultimately make it known to everyone here. Father, we claim you as holy and as righteous today. We just ask that you would turn hearts. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Nobody tell the governor on me, but I'm going to set you all free here for just a minute so you can all take your masks off. Because it's kind of hard to take a mask if you get communion. If you take communion, you get masks on, right? Wait, that didn't work. In uh, Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, on the night Jesus is going to be betrayed, he chooses to spend those last few hours with his disciples sharing a meal together. They're, they're sharing the Passover meal. They're, they're sharing a, a, a Jewish holiday. If you'll remember when the, um, when the plagues were going through Egypt, when, when God's people were still enslaved in Egypt and the plagues went through, one of the, uh, or the final plague was uh, that uh, they were told that the angel of death would pass over each house that night and the oldest child in, in that home would, would die. And, um, but God told his people that if you will take the blood of an innocent lamb and spread it on your doorpost, where the angel sees that blood, he will not enter, but instead he will pass over that house. And instead of death coming to that house, life will remain. So when they talk about Passover, when you hear about the Jewish tradition of Passover, you're, it means that. It, 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 it's a, a remembrance of that. So they're celebrating a Passover meal here. And we can look back and see the significance of what's going to happen. And, and the other people in that room that night other than Jesus didn't know. So he's celebrating this meal with his disciples. And it says in chapter 26, verse 26, As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now you have a little pre-packaged little deal here. And if you take off the very top layer, you're going to expose a little wafer, looks like that. And that represents the bread that night and, and uh, the, the body of Jesus that is going to be broken. So, Adam, would you uh, ask a blessing on the bread, please? Father, thank you for the opportunity to examine our hearts and remember you. And as, as we uh, take this bread, help us to remember the sacrifice that you made and the, the graciousness and the mercy that you give us that, that we do not deserve. Uh, we love you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take the bread today. Mm, tasty. <laughs> In chapter 26, verse 27, after that, it says he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, what he means by that when he says this is my blood of the new covenant, in the Mosaic covenant, in the covenant that God had with his people, um, they covered their sin by killing innocent animals as part of their temple ceremony. Um, if you had sin in your life, you would bring an innocent animal um, and, and you would take it to the altar and it would be sacrificially killed. And the blood of that animal would cover your sin in the eyes of God. The problem was is that people kept sinning, so they kept having to bring animals. And Jesus here says, this is my blood of a new covenant which shed once for the remission of sin. And what he meant was that in the same way you used to bring an innocent animal to cover, for that blood to cover your sin, I, as perfect and righteous, am going to allow my blood to be shed, and the shedding of my blood will cover your sin. And that that shedding of blood will be do, done once for all people. It was done for them, and it was done for all those who believe today and into the future. I'm going to ask Chase if he would give, ask a blessing upon the cup, please. Thank you, 
Lord, for allowing us to gather here and uh, to take this, take this blood of uh, Jesus, which you sacrificed for each and every one of us, Lord, and, and just to be holy with it and to remember what this means for us, our community, and our world, Lord, and be with each and every one of us. Pray. Amen. Amen. So you can take off the next layer, and that exposes the use of being as sterile as we can. Let's all drink together. Jesus left the room that night knowing what was about to happen. And he left the room that night knowing that it wasn't going to be pleasant. In fact, later in his prayer, he asked God, that if it be your will, take this cup from my hands. It wasn't God's will that that happened. And the reason it wasn't God's will that that be taken from his son is because he loved you enough to let that happen. And that overwhelms me sometimes. Um, and we should remember that. Our, our communion today is different than it has been in the past. But... It is still as powerful as, as it was that very first night in that room. Thank you all for being here today. Um, in just a minute, we're going to dismiss. Uh, I'd ask that you all stand, and I'm going to ask Tom Rogers to close us th this morning in, in a word of prayer. Thank you all for being here. As always, we'll kind of dismiss from the back and front.